16, verses 9 through 15. So we're just going to tell a little story. And I'm taking a little bit of artistic liberty, so please be patient with me. Remember, Jesus told parables. Okay. All right. So I want to take a second to kind of get us in the, the mind frame of a first century Christian. And so we're going to follow for a short while the life of a fictitious Christian named Rastus. Typical Greek name at the time. His name is Rastus. And mid to late 20s and born into a poor farming family. And we're in the city of Philippi. And he grew up the the farm all of his life in the years approximately 60 AD. That's relevant because at this time, Nero is the emperor, and he was not friendly to the church in the slightest. Actually, some of the greatest persecution that the church endured was under his reign. And so as you can imagine, the climate for which being a Christian at that time, it wasn't very pleasant. And so somehow he landed a gig, because the thing about Philippi, there's a lot of uh, military veterans there, kind of similar to Norfolk. There's a lot of military veterans there, and the military was a quick way to grow in social clout at that time. And so Rastus landed a job as a footman from some veteran. And so he would run errands for him and go to and fro and running errands. And in the course of his service, serving under this military veteran, you know, I guess there was some ball or some decadent event. He had to go to Lydia, the seller of purple. And during one of those visits there, he had met, and this was much earlier in his service as a footman, he heard this man named Paul preaching some very interesting things because, you see, they grew up in a pagan culture. They did not worship God, and so they worshiped many false gods. And so they began, this Paul began to preach this idea that was so different than anything that he ever heard. He started preaching about this supreme, mighty God that was a creator of the entire universe. And this same creator God desperately loved humanity and was tired of the separation that had come to be. And so this God lowered himself to the form of a man to die for a wicked people who weren't very concerned about him. And so to Rastus, this, this is very strange. Zeus or any of the pantheon, they, would, they wouldn't even dream of doing something like that. They would never dream of the idea of, of coming and condescending and meeting us where, our, where we are and being touched by our afflictions. Foreign concept to him. And so he was mesmerized by this man talking about a God who so loved us that he came to meet us where we were and partook in our afflictions. And so at that point, Rastus inquired more, and Paul broke down the gospel to him, and he was baptized in the name of Jesus, and he received the Holy Ghost, and he became a Christian. So years later, we're back into 60 AD, and Paul's long gone off doing more missionary escapades, and Lydia, the very first convert of Philippi, she begins to recount to the to converts there the story of Paul's coming. She, she began to say, you guys need to know the history of church here. You know, if you take the new members class here, we learn a little bit about how Pastor Blankenship came here to Norfolk. And so she began to recount to the saints at Philippi for all the new converts just how the story began. And so we have Paul awakened in the middle of a night by a dream of a Macedonian man standing afar off crying out, come to us. We need you. Come to us. 
That was the Macedonian call. And Paul responded very quickly and immediately. He was excited about this. He got up and said, I must need go. There's a people there that need the gospel of Jesus. I need to go. And so he took a voyage from Troas to Neopolis. That didn't mean much to us. Let's put it like this. He was on a wooden boat with sails, and he sailed 120 miles on the water to get to his calling. There was no distance too far for him because he said, I must do the will and purpose of God for our life. And we could learn a lesson from Paul in that regard. How far are we willing to go? How much are we willing to sacrifice? How treacherous waters are we willing to endure to do and satisfy the call of God? And so Paul makes it there. And there was a group of believers not quite full in their experience, but they were down by the river having a prayer meeting, praying and worshiping God, and it was led by Lydia. And I'm sure at this point of the story, tears begin to well up in her eyes thinking about how she didn't know the fullness of who God was, and she desperately sought from him, and she prayed, and she prayed, and tried to be as devout as she can, but religion wasn't enough. So Paul sent a man, so God sent a man, and his name was Paul, and he began to preach the gospel to her, and to many great women in the first church of Philippi, was established. I'm sure Rastus, as he heard this story, he was moved. I'm sure he had a burning desire within himself that if I could be like Paul, if God could give me a dream to go somewhere and to do something, oh, that would be amazing. And Paul labored there, and when, when he converted Lydia, and they said, hey, tarry with us. And they formed such deep relationships that Philippians 1 and 8 tells us this is Paul in his bondage uh, about to be persecuted. Soon and very soon, he's going to be gone from this place. He's in a, a house arrest in Rome, and his life is drawing to its end. But this is how he speaks of the church in Philippi. He says, for God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. I'm trying to paint this picture of what it's like to be a first century church. It was an intimate, tight community bound because they were persecuted by powers that be because of the political and social strata that they were in, they were persecuted. Yes. And before I move on, there's one last thing I wanna tell us about the story of Rastus. See, because being Christian was very dangerous. The typical belief system in that day, it's called in theological terms, is a, a, a gradient view of the spiritual world. And so there's like this hierarchy in the spiritual dimension and every God is worthy of worship. But what made Christianity and Judaism unique is that we believed in monolatry, meaning we worship one God and one God alone. Well, if your neighbors are pagan and they believe that worshiping all the different gods for the city and the country and for the world and for the crops and whatever, whatever, that we have to please these gods, it becomes kind of important for you to worship those gods. And so when they see his neighbors, probably a little upset, they're like, yo, what's wrong with Rastus? It's time to go to this temple and to worship this God, and I noticed something, he doesn't go. You see, as a Christian, he took a stand. He said, no, I only worship one God. And so dinner parties with the neighbors probably weren't the most comfortable scene for Rastus. In fact, it can almost be perceived as treason on his part. Because did he not care for the welfare of Philippi? 
or specifically his neighborhood? Because if he did, he would go through all the procedures and worship all the gods that he had to worship to assure the safety and the prosperity of that city. But Rastus said, no, those gods have no power. That's just wood and stone. And you can pray until you're blue in the face. You can sacrifice as many sheep as you like, but they will have no impact. They won't make you any safer, and you won't have any greater prosperity in the field. It all comes from worshiping the one true living God, and his name is Jesus. And so being a Christian, what that meant was, you see, it's two things. So what I'm trying to uh, articulate to us tonight is how do we be, how do we become first century Christians in the 21st century? How do we be like the ones who started a worldwide international revolution? How do we become like them? And there's two things to that. The first being, it says, and the first thought I was thinking about is just that we're in the world, but we're not of it. When we, um, I remember this phrase that Jesse used one time. I thought it was the most profound statement, one of the most profound. I really liked it. He says, you know, when we're saved, we're saved in the middle of our life. We don't get beamed up instantly, and we're not automatically in streets of gold. That's not what happens. You get saved on a Sunday, guess what? You still got to go to work on Monday. And that same annoying boss that you had before, he's going to be the same annoying boss again. <laughs> and so we're saved in the middle of our life. But we're, we, we want to be like that first century church. You see, in Acts 17 and 6, uh, it referred to those Christians as these that have turned the world upside down and they have come hither. When people hear that you're a Christian, this should be one of the things that come to their mind. Yo, this is one of those people who have the ability to impact the world like no one else. They turn the world upside down. It's not another philosophy. It's not another teaching. It's not another invention. It's not the latest phone or gadget. Those things aren't what's going to change the world. It's going to be us having the same experience that they had in the first century and doing the same things that they did. And so, speaking on this, being in the world, but not of the world, pastor put it like this, we're insulated, but not isolated. If we're going to be like those that have turned the world upside down, what that means for us is that we can't just gather amongst ourselves and be afraid to interact with the world around us. We can't be afraid to be around people who look a little bit different than we do. Or maybe they think just a little bit different than we do. Or, or they say words that, my goodness, I would never say that. Or, or they'll talk about things, my goodness, we shouldn't be talking about that. We shouldn't be afraid to be around those people, right? Remember, such were some of us. So lest we forget, <laughs> that was us, you know? And just to make sure we all know that, if you were raised in church, that's okay. You were born in sin. So such were some of us, too. And so it didn't matter. Everybody. Nobody's excluded. Everybody. And so a part of being able to engage this world around us is not being ignorant of the world around us. I'm not saying you got to be a philosopher. I'm not saying that you have to have a PhD in biology and chemistry and physics and literature and ancient Hebrew scholarship. Like, that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, and y'all want to crucify me for this? I'm so sorry. But if you want to reach the world, especially my generation, 
we're going to need the Lord a little bit more than just the Bible. Because you'd be surprised at how many people I talk to that have never read a Bible in their life. And so you start preaching at them, well, the Bible says here about this and that. And they're like, okay, that's cool. Great. We have to know a little bit about the world around us because when, they, when you start preaching to them about a word, they say, dude, that's just a dusty old book that was written a couple thousand years ago. I don't care. I don't care. Oh, but, but Jesus, he, he walked on water. That's cool for your Jesus. I'm glad he did that for you. You know, God, you know, I really don't care, you know. And so, yes, please read the Bible, guys. My goodness, read the Bible. We should read it every day. But what I'm saying is we need to be aware of the world around us. We need to be able to relate to people. It can be something as simple. You know, I saw the most amazing thing. I was at Wawa, probably getting gas or something, I don't know, or food or whatever, I don't know. But I saw two total strangers, did not know each other, but they had, like, hats on with different football teams, and they just had this full out like conversation like they've known each other for years. They found a point of, context, of a connection, they met each other where they were, and instantly a relationship was formed. If, if you, do we have any people here who like sports? If you like sports, you can throw a hand up. Great, you see that? All of you have the ability to win souls. Because all you gotta do is find somebody and say, Hey, what about that sports team? Yeah, you know, it's not as good as my team. I, I'm not saying any names because I don't watch sports. But, you know, you know, your team isn't as good as my team. You can start to jest and have a good time. Bam, a connection was made. Just like that. You can turn the world upside down. Um, in Acts 17, 28, just to get a little scripture to back me up a little bit, we have Paul here. He says, he, we'll just read it. So, for in him we live and move and have our being. And we quote that all the time, and we preach about that all the time, and, and that's really, really, really cool verse, and we're like, man, we can go so many different directions. But he says, as certain also of your poets have said. When we quote that, we're quoting a poem that was written about Zeus. Paul, he knew how to meet people where they were, and bring them to Jesus. The key to impacting our world is meeting them where they are Amen. and taking them to Jesus. That's what Paul did everywhere he went. My goodness, he met them where they were and took them to Jesus. They could have been Epicureans, Jewish, the Stoics, Gentiles, men in the military. It really didn't matter to Paul. He met them where they were. And he took them to Jesus. If we want to impact the world around us, uh, we need to be able to meet people where they are and bring them to Jesus and be a little patient in the process. So talking about being in the world and not of the world, Christianity is a culture. It is a relationship but it's also a culture. And so why that's relevant is because your culture literally dictates how you speak, it's how you process information, it's the lens by which you really view this world. And so, you know, I come from a certain culture where we use a little bit more slang and, you know, we kind of joke real hard and we kind of, you know, we kind of carry on. And so and the way I get along with people is a little bit different. That's the culture that I'm from. You know, and we can all look around, just because it's a military church, we have such a variety of cultures here, and that shouldn't make us uncomfortable. That's Bible. A church full of diverse cultures and colors, that's Bible. You know, unless the city population is 99% of one race, it shouldn't be all of one people in a church. I'm just saying. Your church should reflect the demographics of where you're at, and I'm so thankful to be a part of a body where I see people from all backgrounds, of all types, of all lives, and all walks together in one room. I think that's amazing. So it's really awesome. So, so Christianity is a culture. It's the chief culture above all things. And so when we're forming our opinions, because once again, it's not being afraid of the world around us, not being fearful of engaging. Um, I'm a university student, 
And so, as you can imagine, we have lots of wonderful discussions. My teachers love talking to me because I disagree with everything they say fundamentally. <laughs> when I'm quiet, teachers literally like, Devin, what's going on, man? You, you want to input on this conversation? No, nah, I'm good. You just want me to argue. That's all it was, you know? And so, being comfortable engaging in, in ideas, we don't have to be ashamed of the Bible. It's the most up-to-date living philosophy that exists in this world. There is no greater idea. Put the Bible in any arena and it outclasses everything else. Totally outclasses everything else. That's why I'm able to have discussions with professors significantly older than I am, much more diverse life experience, with their doctorate degrees and all these different letters and all these different experiences, uh, but I can go at them as, as toe to toe, not because I'm some brilliant guy. I'm really not all that smart, <laughs> you know? But it's the word of God. Amen. It's truth. It defends itself. Yes, it does. We just have to let it. We can't be afraid of the fact that Oh, they might think I'm some antiquated traditionalist. Oh, no. I'm so old-fashioned. They don't want to hear anything that I have to say. No, that's not true. Not in the slightest. So remember, Christianity is a culture. It needs to be the highest culture in our life. It, it should be the lens by which we view the world. It should be the, 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 the filter for every thought and every action. And we know that all of this is built off two commandments, love God and love others. Yeah. Every interaction, every comment, every political opinion Amen. should be based off of love God, love others. Amen. And, you know, I love talking about politics. And, like, I get into a lot of disagreements with a lot of people, you know. That's neither here nor there. But in the process, I don't forget, love God, love people. We got to love God, and we got to love people. And so no matter how you're interacting in the world with around you, love God, love people. And so last point, speaking on uh, is that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We need to realize that what we have in us is greater than what's around us. The pressure of what's inside should be stronger than what's the pressures around us in this world. Right? We shouldn't be concerned that your faith is going to crumple the moment you step out of the church parking lot. Oh my goodness, there's so much sin and brokenness in the world. I'm going to crumple. Our faith needs to be just a tad bit stronger than that. Amen. If you go to work and people don't even know that you're Christian because you're afraid of being persecuted, I want to encourage you today. You have God Almighty dwelling inside of you. Your boss, your coworkers, your company, they do not control your future. They don't possess the ability to alter your life so drastically. Let's just say they, oh, you're going to get fired for being Christian. That's cool. God will just give you a better job with higher pay. And even if he didn't, it wouldn't matter because you have God living inside our view. Our contentment comes from him, not our external circumstances. First John chapter 4, verse 4 says, ye are of God little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We have, what we have on the inside is so much greater. Can't even compare. Can't even compare. And so because of this, now I want to put a clarifier. Let's not go to work tomorrow. Go to my, let's go to your boss. God bless, I'm a Christian, and, you know, this is how things are going to be. You're going to stop cussing in front of me, and if you do, holy wrath, and fire's coming down from heaven, and relax. That is not what I'm saying. <laughs> that is not why I'm, I'm not saying that. Please don't do that, no. <laughs> you know, just... You know, there's a conversation going on, and 
you know, the boys are around, and they're just talking about the bar drinking and the bar hopping that they're going to do. And they're like, hey, man, do you want to come with us? Don't be afraid to say, hey, man, no, I just, I don't drink. Right. Well, well, why not? You know, one is bad for my liver, so I mean, I probably shouldn't be doing that. But, but two, I serve a God that wants me to be sober and vigilant. I'm waiting for his coming. I can't be so intoxicated that when he comes, I miss his coming. I need to be watching. I can't do that if I'm drunk out of my mind. I need to be watching. And so it's okay. It's little conversations like that. We don't have to be afraid of those. It's okay. And so... We're talking about being a first century church in the 21st century. So we have to remember that we're in the world and not of the world. Point number two, we need to be possessed by purpose. That first century church was so driven. My goodness, they were so driven. But let's take it back. Let's go back to Genesis. We're going to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. I'm going to take it back. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And because I, I want, because we're possessed by purpose, so we need to understand, well, what is our purpose? Why are we here? What is all this about? Why was I created? Why am I here? You know, and all those big questions, you know. Well, let's start here. It says that, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. The garden was the appointed place of God. It can be seen as like a, a metaphor of types for the church. Remember, God put him in the garden. We don't get to come to God on our own terms. Yes, come as you are. Dude, that's to dude, we love everybody. Dude, everyone come in. Yeah, dude, we're for that. However, to be in the church... The same way God placed man in the garden, we need to be placed in the church. And the scripture makes it very clear. There's only one way that we're going to be in covenant relationship with Jesus, and that's being baptized in his name and filled with his spirit. There really is no other way. If we don't have his spirit, we're none of his. Why would you not want the spirit? I mean, it's the most amazing thing ever. So, total little story. I remember getting baptized, and I was in the back of the carpenter's car, and we were, they were taking me out to eat. Shout out to the carpenters. They're legit. And so I was, they were taking me out to eat, and I was having a fit in the back seat. I'm like, y'all, look, the grass is greener. Like, this is the most, all, I didn't even get the Holy Ghost. I was just baptized. I'm like, yo, look at the grass, man. This is the craziest thing. Like, do y'all not see this? We're not looking at the same thing. I was so ecstatic about being baptized. And then I remember receiving the Holy Ghost. I thought it was the craziest thing. I said, I can speak another language? And so, keep in mind, I was 16. And so I was praying one time at the house, and I heard myself speak in tongues for the first time. I was like, whoa. <laughs> This is crazy. Like, all right, y'all gonna laugh, but it's okay. I literally recorded myself praying so I can listen back. I was like, oh my God, that's me. Dude, that's me. Man, I got the Holy Ghost. I was really excited to get the Holy Ghost. I thought it was the craziest. I'm like, yo, I'm speaking another language. I'm bilingual. There we go. Dude, I was excited. I was excited. But, um,. Detour's over. I'm going to bring it back. Okay. And so our purpose, we were put in the garden to dress it and to keep it. We were meant to work the garden and preserve the garden. We were created to create. We were created to work hand in hand with Jesus and create a beautiful world. That's our purpose. Everything that we do should be feeding back to that purpose. We need to be creating a beautiful world with Jesus, which means everywhere we go, by our lifestyle, by our communications, by everything that we do, we need to be establishing the kingdom of God. Because wherever his kingdom is, everything else must submit. Well, what do you mean? And so you have somebody's a coworker, and they're gossiping about the boss. Swerve that. We need to respect them to have the rule over you, even if you don't like the boss. 
What that does is it creates an atmosphere for the presence of God. It establishes his kingdom. And so when you go to share the gospel, God's already working. God's already moving because you're living out and then convincing others with your lifestyle to allow Jesus to come into that place. When you honor those that have the rule over you, God can't help but bless that. Even if they're kind of not the best, God can't help but bless that. And so when you have that coworker that's coming to you, man, ain't so-and-so, he's this and that, and I just can't stand him. Yeah, but, you know, look, he signed your paycheck, and, you know, you, you requested off that one time. He, he gave you the time off, and, you know, look, look, we all got our bad days, right, you know? And you kind of, you're honoring them that have the rule over you. God will bless that. Another side note, I'm sorry. We should be the best workers at any job that we're at. Hallelujah. If you're not the best student, if you're not the best coworker, if you're not the best worker, come on, man. We have a cheat sheet on how to be the best Amen. at wherever we're at. Whatever we put our hands to do, Amen. we need to do it with all your might. Amen. Secret, I'm going to reveal the secret. I hate pharmacy school with a burning passion. <laughs> I don't want to be a pharmacist, not even a little bit. But you know what I did? I studied for 20 to 40 hours a week, depending on how heavy the course load is. Why? Because I wasn't going to go to school and give Jesus halfway. It'd be really hard to convert someone telling them, hey, you know, Jesus is awesome. Yeah, but you're failing. How are they going to hear the gospel when I'm failing classes? How are you going to share the gospel with your boss if you're always late? Like, yeah, your God's good, but you're lazy. Like, what? Who are we going to help, man? We can't help anybody like that. We need to be good at what we do. We need to be good at what we do, man. Amen. Another, another clarifier. Another clarifier. Now, I'm not suggesting becoming such a workaholic that you neglect the house of God. We, we can't do that either. We don't want to neglect God's house. So, balance. We don't fight extreme with extreme. And so building this beautiful and awesome world with Jesus, that's, that's our purpose. That's what we're supposed to be doing. But sometimes we get so caught up fighting the good fight. Warren in spiritual warfare, I mean, just the devil's fighting you every day. And we forget our purpose and we forget our first works. We're about to read a lengthy portion of scripture. Please don't fall asleep. If you get tired, stand up. It's going to be okay. We're about to read five verses. I know. That's a lot. We're about to read five verses. So if you get tired, that's okay. Stand up. Nobody is going to judge you. And if they do, they're probably sleepy too. It's okay. And so Jesus will get them later. So. I'm going to read those five verses. Let's go. It's going to be Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. It says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how Thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and has borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has fainted not. Nevertheless, about to get a little uncomfortable, guys. We're about to get a little uncomfortable. Please brace yourself. I'm going to say some things that's going to make us uncomfortable in the next little while. Let's brace ourselves, okay? It's about to get a little uncomfortable. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Second warning. It's about to get uncomfortable. Let's brace ourselves, guys. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. 
third warning. It's about to get a little uncomfortable. So we're gonna work through it. It's gonna be all right. I'm Devin, I'm your friend. I love you guys, remember that. I love you guys. Okay, so here we go. It's gonna be a little uncomfortable. Um, yeah, sometimes walking with Jesus, you know, we, we get, we're, we're brand new into this thing and we have this zeal and this passion and I'm like, yo, I'm going to tell everybody, not everybody, everybody, I'm going to tell everybody about Jesus. I could be at the bus stop. I can be at the gas station. Every classmate, everybody, everybody's going to know, excuse me, everybody, everybody's going to know about Jesus. People going to know about the Holy Ghost. They're going to know about Jesus' name, baptism. And we had that experience, uh, and we were so on fire, and we were so ecstatic that we, we couldn't help but think about it day in and day out. Uh, and everywhere we went, uh, all we could do was talk about Jesus. But sometimes, not the wonderful people here, but there's some saints, not, not this church, this is, this is not here, but I'm talking about there are theoretically some saints who time progress. They get a little tired, a little weary from Warren. They get a little busy in life. They have a couple kids and, you know, and, you know, they say, you know, I've been serving the Lord for 20 years and I've done this, that, and the third. Look, I'm not talking about the saints here. Y'all Gucci. Y'all, this, this is a good body of this. this let's give a hand. <laughs> I'm so thankful for the church here, so it's not these saints, but I know of some saints where they, they get a little bit older and they think, well, you know, I, I serve my time. You know, I've, I've been a good soldier and I'm just holding out. You know, I don't gotta, sh I don't gotta share the gospel anymore. Lord, I done showed it, sh shared it enough and my, my vocal cords have it written there. It, my, 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 my throat knows about the gospel. I'm parched talking about the Lord. I've been doing it for so long. Or there's some of us who are like, you know, I don't know about opening up my home to do no Bible study. Whew. I don't know about that. My house, I just finally got it to where it was. I finished my last project. It finally looked good. I don't need some smelly old drunk in my house. Why? Like, Jesus, I just painted the place. Why would I want a drunk in my house? What? Or, God forbid, he reached out to you and said, hey, you know, down on Church Street, that's where the night walkers are. And they need the gospel, too. Rahab was a night walker, but mightily used of God. I'm just saying, let's not, you know, let's not forsake anybody. And so, sometimes we, we get so long in our walk with God that we get a little tired. So, you know what, I'm just kicking my feet up. You know... It doesn't matter that Children's Church need helpers. I don't, that doesn't matter. You know, I've been serving the Lord for 25, 30 years, you know. Or it doesn't matter that, you know, there's different needs, you know. We have the ministry here slaving away, sick as a dog, having to, tr to drive a bus hours, sick as all get out. But, you know, I serve God for 30 years. 30 years. You know what I'm saying? And so it just... All I'm saying is, let us, not this body, because we're good here, but me and all those other saints that have been walking with God and we're, we're getting tired, we need to repent from where we are falling. Repent from how we were really hungry to share the gospel everywhere we went. We remember where we used to be, where we couldn't wait to get up and go to work, not because of the job, because now I have another opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. I'm going to go inside this 7-Eleven to pay for gas. I'm not going to use my card because I just want a chance to talk to the cashier to tell somebody about the goodness of God. Myself and a couple of older saints that aren't here at this church, we need to repent and remember the first work. Amen. And just to add on that, and then I'm going to leave it, leave it alone, but it said that, blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Yeah. Luke 12, 43. Blessed is the servant that when he comes back, He's going to see you doing. Amen. 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 
I don't know. Uh, I just didn't know. This is the last thing, and I'm going to move on, I promise. I didn't know there was an age limit where we can retire from being a saint. We have a job here in this world, and 65 or 67 is the retirement age. I don't think it works like that in the kingdom of Jesus. If you have strength in your body, this is me included. I'm not, I'm not talking to this church because we're good here. I'm talking about a different church. But, you know, but if you got strength in your body, if you can walk and you can drive, if you, if you have the strength to go to the store and buy the chips and watch whatever you want to watch on TV, you have the strength to serve God. Sister Cook, bedridden with cancer, is converting nurses and doctors. Amen. We are without excuse. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. And so, our motive for this work, though, it's, it's, uh, it's love. It's not numbers. I want to make that clarifier for what I'm about to say. It is love. It's not about numbers. It's all about love. We're not trying to build a mega church. That's not what I'm saying. However, what I am saying is there's a prophecy over this church for a thousand member church. Amen. That's not going to happen unless we get to work. That's right. That's right. The field is white. He prayed for laborers. We don't need to pray for the field. We're in the end times. We're already promised the greatest outpouring that this world could ever imagine. The things that we're supposed to see should just the apostle should be dumbfounded at the things that we see. Totally dumbfounded. So we don't have to pray for the field. It's already ripe. We don't have to pray for people that when we be hungry for the gospel. They're already hungry. Matter of fact, we don't even have to pray for the laborers. I can give the answer. Let's look in the mirror. That prayer's been answered. There we go. We're good. But like I said, it's not about numbers. It's not about numbers, y'all. It's not about numbers. It's about love. You know? When I uh, went to meet the board to get approved for the church at Hampton, right, to get the start to work there, I asked them. There's a lot of pastors there. They're all pastors, and they're all up there in age. And I said, what is it that enabled y'all to work like this for so long? And at that point, they were a lot lighter in the conversation. They were jovial. And then it got deathly serious. I'm like, oh, what did I just say? <laughs> so they got deathly serious. And they looked at me. They said, you know, people will make you tired. Amen. People will wear you out. If you've ever met a human being, you know what they're saying. People can make you tired, man. Ugh. Like, people can just drain everything you have, and you're just, your tank is empty, and you're like, Jesus, I need pizza, coffee, and some video games or something, dude. Like, I need rest, you know? I'm just kidding. I need to pray and read the Bible. That's how I fill up. Prayer in the Bible, you know? But they're like, you know, people wear you out, man. They wear you out. They said, but what enabled them to labor for so long is a love for the lost. I don't share the gospel with people because I need to get some token or some badge to be super Christian. I don't share the gospel so I can get up here on the mic and be, and be famous. God has given me plenty of talents that if I take them in the world, I can be famous there. I'm not here to be famous. Amen. I'm not trying to be the number one soul winner and so, so people can accolades and slap me in the back and be like, man, good job, Devin. You're doing so good. Mm, no. That didn't do it for me. That stuff really didn't matter. It's growing up in the broken home that I grew up in. Is looking around and seeing just how broken this world is. Can we can we just take a second and just observe the world around us? Turn on the news, you'll get plenty enough depressed. Right? We have people being raped, murdered, slaughtered by the thousands. For what? We have people stealing from each other, just being totally wicked. You know, we have young men killing other young men 
just because of the neighborhood that they're from. So the neighborhood I grew up, we were feuding with another, another neighborhood. When I say we, I mean them. I just happened to live there. And so there was this feud. And so I went to the grocery store, and one of the guys from the other neighborhood came in our neighborhood. I just happened to live there. I wasn't a part of that. And they were like, you yeah, know, representing my neighborhood. I'm like, you can get shot for a neighborhood. Keep in mind, you're a child. You didn't even choose to live there. And so now you're repping some neighborhood, and like people are literally killing each other over that. That's a broken world. We have daddies in jail, kids growing up without daddies. We live in a broken world. We have mamas strung out on drugs, and, and, and kids being born, having been born to a parent that's addicted to heroin. Babies come out the womb addicted to heroin. This is a broken world. We have teenagers, and, and suicide is on an uptick. We have teenagers laying in bed at night, uh, miserable, just saying, what's the point? I have no purpose. I have no value. Why even be here? It's just a matter of time before we see another new cycle of another teenager who hung themselves, took too many drugs, or shot themselves. Our world is broken. If we're not moved by the brokenness of the world, something in us ain't right. If we're so desensitized to the death of people, to people being raped, to, to suicide, if all of this is going on in the world, if that doesn't move us, there is something wrong. They're the reason why I preach the gospel, why I'm so obsessed about talking about Jesus because of Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me and every single one of us here because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, those that are suffering, those that are in emotional bondage, to preach deliverance to the captives, those that are strung out and they're addicted to all kinds of perversion in this world. God anointed me for those people. He anointed us for those people. Recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. This is why we're here. This is our purpose. If this verse isn't possessing you and moving you every step, every day, every moment, there's something wrong. We need to be realigned again. When we leave the house, we should be so overwhelmed. We should be like the Apostle Paul sitting in Athens, stirred within ourselves because the city was given wholly unto idolatry. We've lost our God consciousness in the country, and so now we're filling everything else with the place of God, and that's why we have so much brokenhearted, bound people who are bruised. Because they're given wholly to idolatry. They don't know a God, so they go to the bottle. They don't know a God, so they turn the women. They don't know the God, so they do all these different things. And it's just become an idol. When we're in the world, we should be moved like Paul. Because our neighborhood, our job, our school is given wholly to idolatry. That should move us. This is what it means to be possessed by purpose. If we understand those two things, that we're in the world and we're not of it. And we're possessed by this verse here and we're compelled to share the gospel because of the great need that we have. Then we can be that first century church that turn the world upside down. If we can all stand and let the musicians, if they can come. This needs to be our prayer tonight. We just have a couple minutes and I have nothing left to share. I just, 
We need to pray. We need to pray that this verse is our anthem, it's our heartbeat, it's every breath that we breathe. This verse needs to be so ingrained in who we are as a people that we can't escape it. That every time we see someone on the street, we ought to be stirred. We ought to be moved. This verse needs to be more than just words penned by some doctor 2,000 years ago. It needs to be our story that when people read our lives, they can say that this church has been anointed to reach. If we can, as a family, let's come to the altar. Let's, as a family, all of us, let's come. And we're going to pray. We're going to pray this prayer. We're going to pray for a fresh anointing and burden to preach the gospel. That's what we're going to pray for tonight. But before we, we go there, we need to be like the church in Ephesus, uh, and we need to repent. Maybe some of us have got comfortable in where we are, and we got so busy and caught up in life that we've kind of fell out of love with the first work. So I'm not going to cheerlead us tonight. I'm not going to do the cheerleading. I'm just going to pray with y'all. We're going to pray together. Let's take a moment and let's repent. God, I want to go back to the first works. Let's repent. Jesus, I'm sorry I got comfortable in my Christianity. Jesus, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry that I've allowed my time with you and I've become complacent to the needs of the body, to the needs of the church, but more importantly, the needs to the world around me. God, I've forgotten. God, I forgot what it's like to be stirred in the middle of a night thinking about a lost world. God, I've left my first love. God, I repent. I don't want to leave tonight feeling the same way when I came in. I want to be absolutely obsessed with my first love. I want to be excited to go to work again, to tell people about Jesus. I want to be excited to go to school, to tell my classmates about Jesus. God, I don't want this repentance to be just another altar call, or just another emotional experience. But God, I want authentic change. And because of that now, God, we're praying, pour out a fresh anointing. God, you have anointed us to preach the gospel, which means we can go in boldness. We can go in power, and we can help those all around us. That God, when we see those hurting and in need, God, you've equipped us, and you empowered us to be world changers, to help somebody in need to save somebody from suicide to pull someone out of addiction God you've anointed us God pour out a, a fresh burden on your people God we need that fresh burden we need to lay down our responsibilities God we need that burden all over again brokenhearted. Don't let me be okay with seeing people bound. God, I need that burden. I need it, God. I need to wrestle with this thing. There's so many people in need. God, I want to be sensitive. I want to be responsive to that. God, I want to be moved by that. God's here, 
if you feel the prompting of the Spirit, let's just begin to pray for one another. Let's just encourage one another tonight. This wasn't a message to condemn. This wasn't a message to condemn. I just want, let's just pray with each other. Let's encourage one another tonight. Let our faith be built. Let's just begin to find someone next to you if it's appropriate. Lay hands with them and let's pray right now for the encouragement of God. We are called. We are anointed. We have power. We have authority. We can be witnesses for your kingdom. We don't have to be afraid right now by the authority of the word of God and by the power of the name of Jesus. I declare a Holy Ghost boldness for every person under the sound of my voice in Jesus' name.